Well, good evening and welcome to East Newton Baptist Church Wednesday night Bible study. We are so thankful that you have tuned in to listen tonight. A uh, couple of announcements before we begin. I uh, wanted to remind you that you can find your prayer sheet for tonight, your prayer bulletin, on Facebook. And uh, you can pray for those that are listed on there. And I would just remind you as well that if you don't uh, see somebody on there or you see somebody on there that maybe needs to come off, if you could call Susan at the church office and let her know uh, that you need to make that change, it would be very helpful. Sometimes we have people on the list and we're not sure to take them off. And so uh, thank you for those that have called in. But if you see something you'd like to update, please let us know. Also, I do have a bit of good news, and I'll make an official announcement tomorrow, uh, but we are coming back to in-person Sunday, in-person Sunday. Uh, that means that worship will be in-person, and then we're going to give Sunday school classes the opportunity to be in-person as well. Uh, if your class uh, would get together and talk about it, your leadership, if you want to come back, you can, um, and you can also do the Zoom classes that you've been doing as well, um, so those are that's a that's an option that's available to you. There will be some things that will be in place that are different from the time before when we were here. Uh, number one, uh, temperature checks will take place at the door. Uh, so if you have a fever above 100 degrees, uh, you will you will not be allowed to come into the building. Uh, so uh, so we'll be checking those at the door. Uh, also, uh, there'll be masks required in the buildings, uh, in the building at all times, unless you are up on this platform for worship, or if you're teaching a Sunday school class, you may take your mask off. So we're going to, for the next you know few weeks anyway, require the mask until the numbers get a little bit more under control. Uh, also, the uh, third thing I would just remind you of is we had gotten toward the end of our meeting together in November a little less diligent about remaining socially distant from one another. And so I would ask you for, to have your family sit with you uh, six feet away from other families. And so we'll have the pews taped off at this point, and uh, we'll try to be creative how we get folks in here. And then um, the fellowship hall will still be open for a live stream, but the same rules that apply in here will apply in there as well. It'll just be a smaller amount of people. So those are some of the things that will be, will be going on. We'll have hand sanitizer set up at the door. If you forget your mask, we'll have some extra mask here uh, that you can use when you come in. So we'll be ready to go Sunday. But we're excited about getting back to worship, and we'll just be very safe when we come back and, and get back to that. I would just uh, let you know that we're not bringing back Wednesday nights until after the fall break is over for the kids. So uh, so rather than come back one week and then skip a week and then come back again for the kids, we're going to wait until, uh, until a little later to bring back Wednesday nights. So we're only talking about coming back to in-person activities on Sunday. Uh, so just be aware of that, and we'll, uh, we'll make plans to do that. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and let's pray for our prayer request here tonight. Father, we thank you so much for the time we have to uh, to gather, uh, Father, whether it be online or in person, uh, gather and study your Bible. And we thank you, Lord, for the ability to, uh, to read uh, words from you uh, in this text that we will look at tonight and to gain a perspective on what you're calling us to do, how you're calling us to live, and then a reflection on uh, some of the uh, tragic mistakes and sins of others uh, so that we can learn from them and, and not be in danger of repeating those things ourselves. We also want to pray for all those who are on our list uh, tonight, our prayer bulletin. We pray, God, that you'll just bless them. Uh, Father, there are so many different needs, so many different types of uh, ailments and illnesses and, and uh, other issues. Father, you know each and every need. You know each and every hurt. We pray, God, that you will just uh, be with those on our list. Bless those who are dealing with covid uh, those that are recovering, uh, those that have just recently been diagnosed that we know. Uh, Father, just watch over them. And Father, we just be sure to praise you for that. Father, you are the great physician. You're able, and we, we thank you, Lord, for that. We also pray for those who have upcoming procedures and surgeries. Pray that you'll just watch over them in a special way. Father, heal them, bring them back to us quickly. 
Father, we just love you and thank you for all that you do and all that you are in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we're going to finish up our study on the book of Amos, and so I would ask that you turn with me to Amos chapter 9, uh, Amos chapter 9 and verse 11, and we'll read through verse 15, which is the end of the book. Uh, The verses that we'll look at tonight are strikingly different than the words that have preceded. Uh, Up until this point, the book has mostly been about bad news, about Uh, judgment about the coming punishment that was going to take place uh, on the lives of those people in Israel, the northern kingdom. And we've seen here and there just a little bit of a glimpse of hope, but no real passages that are strongly hopeful about the future. We we did see last week a final warning, uh, and this final warning was suggesting that there was There was very little hope for them to avoid the punishment and judgment. Uh, But we also see this week that there is a future promise that that God would not fully and totally destroy Israel. Uh, Last week was the, the really bad news. This week is the really good news. So read with me in Amos chapter 9, verse 11 to 15. In that day, this is the Lord, in that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seeds, and the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Some some scholars out there would look at this passage of Scripture that we've just read and would say this is so strikingly different than the rest of the book of Amos. It, it could not have been put there by Amos. It just doesn't go with his tone. Uh, it, it had to be some scribe that added that at the end uh, to send a message of hope to the people of Israel. But whenever you talk in terms of this couldn't possibly be something that Amos wrote, whenever you talk in terms of that, what you're really doing is you're taking out of the perspective that God had a plan and purpose. You are taking out of the perspective that he had a plan and purpose, that he sent Amos to deliver that plan and that purpose. And you're completely and utterly avoiding the idea that God is sovereign and that he is sending Amos for the primary purpose of delivering judgment upon the nation of Israel But he's also sending Amos to remind him at the very end of his judgment that God would not truly and fully abandon his people, that he had a plan and a purpose that far exceeded their disobedience. And so certainly Amos wrote this. Certainly this was part of Amos's message. And when we begin to say that, you know, something you know, can't be both bad news and good news, we miss out on what the gospel is all about. Because the gospel really starts with bad news. I'm a sinner. I'm a worthless sinner who can do nothing to save myself. You can't share the good news until you know the bad news, and you've heard the bad news, and you understand the bad news. Uh, But you have to hear the bad news to understand the hope and the hopefulness that is coming through in passages like our passage tonight. And so, also many would look at that and see, you know, after the exile, Israel was restored to some degree. But it's interesting to note that Israel was not restored to the same place they were before the, uh, the, the split of the kingdom and then ultimately the exile. They were, they were nowhere near the the greatness that they were under, under the reign of Solomon and the reign of David. 
And so even when they were restored, it wasn't the picture of what we see here in this text. It, it's, a, it's a small glimpse of it, but the picture of what we see in this text is heaven. The picture of what we see in this text is, is eternal glory. Uh, we see uh, that someone will sit on the throne of David forever, and we see these things, and we understand that it's pointing ahead to something that hasn't happened yet. So even though there would be a restoration that take place that would, that would bring some hope into the nation of Israel, what we're looking at is something future. And so some would say, well, this, this wasn't written by Amos. It was written by someone after the restoration of Israel uh, whenever they had come back from exile. Again, baloney. <laughs> baloney. Amos wrote this because God told him his plan was to bring about restoration, and the restoration that came after the exile was not the restoration that's being talked about here in this passage. It's about heaven. So uh, the plan and purpose of God, he has ordained before the foundation of the world. That is, before he created the world, God has ordained a plan, and he's bringing it to fruition through his interaction with humanity and through the history of the world and the future of the world. And eventually and finally, he will fully bring it to completion in his eternal kingdom. And so whenever we say, you know, well, Amos couldn't possibly have known this was going to happen, and, and somebody else must have written it. What we're really saying is we don't believe God has a plan and a purpose, and we don't have hope in our own lives. So Amos certainly did write this, and Amos certainly is talking about the plan of God. And so we see the declaration of judgment. You see the final warning. But you see the hope in beginning in verse 11. But if you look back in verse 8, uh, when he's delivering this final judgment, he said, the Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. So even in chapter 8, I mean chapter 9, in verse 8, in the midst of his declaration of judgment, we see a glimpse of hope. And then, beginning in verse 11, we see full hope laid out for the future. And so... Prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. We have heard him say that earlier. But we also understand that God has always planned to restore Israel. In our text, Amos uses the first person to show God is the one speaking here. And in that, God makes three promises about the restoration of Israel. First, he makes a promise of restoration. Uh, verses 11 and 12 in that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. The Lord had given a vivid account of destruction that would take place on the nation of Israel, but in verses 11 and 12, it's the restoration of the temple, uh, of the tent, I'm sorry, the tent of David, the tabernacle of David. The tent or the booth of David has fallen. What's the Lord referring to here? Well, the tent represents David's royal line. David's royal line. And we know the promise that God had made that David would have a son that sat on the throne forever and ever. But David's heirs didn't have that much success uh, in the kingdom. And so uh, we look forward to a future son of David that would sit on the throne and so he's talking about that time where he would restore the Davidic kingdom and the Davidic king. Uh, and so the idea here is of a battle that has torn down the temp tent. And then uh, the nation had been routed and destroyed. And the tent who represented the, the, the ruler, David, would be fallen. And the idea of a tent representing a ruler, this is a weak version of a dwelling as opposed to the royal palaces and particularly the splendid palace that, that Solomon built. And God had promised that David would have a son that ruled, and so he's using this tent to show the weakness of David, David's children, David's reign, uh, and that it had fallen, but that God would raise it up again and do something better. After Solomon's death, the kingdom was ripped in two. That's how the kingdom split after Solomon's death. And, you know, the Lord would restore it. The Lord would 
pick it up. It would, he would uh, take the wall and repair it and re- repair the breaches in the wall and in the tent. And, uh, you know, those had, that had rebelled against God, against the authority of God, we would not see that rebellion when God does his restoring. And so he would restore the Davidic line. He would seal up the cracks and holes in the Davidic kingdom and the people. And then he would build it like it was before. And the king this time would sit on the throne, not for a limited amount of time, but forever. The apostles were clear that Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, Jesus came to do a lot of things, and we talked a a little bit about it in previous sermon series, but uh, Jesus was the high priest. He's the king, the uh, the, the mighty king, the high priest, and he's the greatest prophet. And so, you know, for him to be the king, he had to be born in the line and lineage of David. And so he's the line of the tribe of Judah. But we also note that he's, the, he's a priest. But to be a priest in the order of Levi, he had to be born of Levi. But you remember that Jesus is a priest in the, in the line of Melchizedek, who was a priest in the book of Genesis. So these roles that Jesus fulfills are important. But the one that, that, um, that Amos is referring to here, the Lord is referring to through Amos, is Uh, the King of kings and Lord of lords that would sit on the throne of David forever. Uh, The apostles uh, talked about this, they prophesied about this, and they spoke about this, they taught about this. And the kingdom of Israel would not only include the former kingdom, but it would also include people from all the nations of the earth, pagan nations that have been destroyed and judged as well. So when God raises up the future kingdom, it's not just going to include the kingdom of Israel, it's going to include people from every kingdom of the earth, every tribe and every tongue. While it's true that the nation of Israel had been elected, chosen, and called out by God for a specific purpose, and God called them out to be a special possession, to be a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation, that is, a nation that's been set apart for the purposes of God. The kingdom of priests were to be a witness to others about the glory of God, and they were to proclaim the way of salvation that that God had given, but they failed miserably. God had distinguished them and set them apart out of all the other nations, and he called them out to be clean and holy and righteous, and the separate nature of their actions and their life was to proclaim a holiness and point to the holiness of God. And so they were set apart to show the set apart one. They were set apart to point to the one who is holy, and they were set uh, set apart to show God. Interestingly, the judgments of the other nations beginning in the first part of the book and then the judgment of Israel Israel served to show that Israel, while they were chosen by God and distinct in some ways, they were like other nations in some ways. But the Lord would not forget his promise that he made to them, that he would restore them and he would be faithful to them and he would uh, keep a holy remnant faithful to him. And not only would he restore Israel, the people that came against God's people, the pagan nations of the earth would have people called out from amongst them to join the people of God. So God's purpose has always been to use a people to bless other people, to use a kingdom to bless other people. Israel was a kingdom, a priest called out by God, a royal nation to share and proclaim his love. The church is a people of God called out to share the message of God and bless all the nations of the earth. Here's a question. Did the nation of Israel ultimately fail in her purpose to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth? And the answer to that is an unequivocal no, they did not fail in that. Now you may say, well, Everything we read in the Old Testament shows that they did fail. And, and in that way, if you look at it in the Old Testament history, you see they did fail miserably. But, but we find out in the New Testament that Jesus is the true Israel, the true Son of God. And he would be the one that would 
obey God, live a perfect and sinless life, and become the sacrifice for all the nations of the earth to bless all the nations of the earth. So eventually, through the person of Jesus Christ, Israel did, in fact, bless all the nations of the earth and did, in fact, fulfill that which God had called them to do because Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament covenants. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And through his work and ministry, life, death, burial, and resurrection, he did accomplish just that. Jesus is the child of promise. Jesus, when we look at Abraham and we look at his son Isaac, and we say Isaac is the child of promise, well, ultimately, the child of promise is the one that will carry on his line until Jesus comes, who is the true child of a promise. He's the blessing, and he is our brother. The nation of Israel would not be judged, uh, would be judged, but God would lift them up and restore them. It was a promise. So a promise of, of restoration. Secondly, a promise of blessing. A promise of blessing. Verse 13 and 14, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, when the treader of the grapes uh, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. Uh, Amos not only foresaw the judgment that would come on Israel, he foresaw the day in which they would be restored by the Lord and he would give them great blessing. Moses prophesied about this particular thing as well. If you have your Bibles so they are with you, turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 30, and let's look at verse 1 to 3. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and call them into mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will, be, he will gather you from uh, again from all the peoples where the Lord your God scattered you. And then on down in verse 5. He says, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And then down in verse 9, he says, and the Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of the ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers. And so... Uh, Moses pointed ahead to this time where, where this promise of great blessing. So there's a promise of restoration, but it's not just restoration. It is the lavishing of God's blessing upon them. Their crops would do well. Their wombs would give birth. They would have great and wonderful blessings from God because God made a promise to them. And here's the simple truth. God always keeps his promises. In verses 13 to 14, we see two ways in which the Lord would keep his promises that are laid out in the book of Amos. First, he would make the land fertile. The plowman would overtake the reaper. This means that the harvest is so great that they were able to continue picking fruit and, and uh, produce and crops off the vine until it was ready to plant again. So that's what that means. The, the, the reaper... The plowman would overtake the reaper. So the plowman comes up and gets ready to replow, and they're still taking stuff off the vine. This means that the harvest was so great that God was blessing them. Usually there's about a six-month period between the reaping and the plowing. This, there would be no time in between that. How would you like to have a garden all year round that was putting out something? That would be awesome. Uh, then they'd have plenty to eat and plenty of resources to support themselves, and this was a blessing of God. Second, he, he offered them a general blessing of comfort, that they would receive a general blessing of comfort. They would ha have their uh, homes and cities rebuilt and inhabited. They would replant their fields and vineyards. They replant their gardens and enjoy fruit. God was going to reverse the judgment on the nation. The Lord was promising a day when once again they would enjoy the satisfaction of their labor, and all of it would be the Lord's doing. So the promise of blessing, the promise of restoration. Number three, the promise of security in verse 15. Let me read verse 15 to you as we turn back to Amos. 
And I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. And so what we see here is a promise of security. God will give them their land, uh, the land that he had promised them, the land that he told them would be flowing with milk and honey, and they would dwell in that land and possess it forever. They would never again be rooted out of the land. As we look at this, we, we think back to Sunday's sermon on the eternal security of the believer. A blessed assurance was the title of that sermon. We must understand the significance of the promised land in the Old Testament. It was a place, a real physical place uh, in the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. But it also represents a future place, a real literal place, a place where, where there will be no sin, a place where there'll be no suffering, a place of heaven. So the promised land to the people of Israel is also the promised land that we look forward to in a place of bliss and eternal security. And so this is symbolic of the blessing that God had promised all throughout the Old Testament uh, and into the New, that, that we would have a place to dwell. In my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus said, and so we look forward to having a place to dwell forever and ever in a covenant with God. And it represents the fact that God's people have a special relationship with him because it was not their doing that they entered into the promised land in the first place. They lived in homes they did not build. They possessed cities they did not build. They, they reaped from vineyards that they did not plant. And so, you know, it was the God's doing entirely from beginning to end and so there is the element at which we just simply lean on God. It is his place. He is allowing us to live there. We are his children and we trust in him and we're secure in that covenant that he's made. And we look forward to that time when we're in heaven with him and we'll be totally dependent upon him for everything in our lives as we are now. So what is the Lord's promise? Well, the Lord's promise is that he will permanently plant his people in the promised land after raising the booth of David and repairing it. That is, there is a coming Messiah. It is through this Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we are included in the kingdom of God. It is through Jesus Christ that we have peace and security and blessing, and greater still, it's through Jesus Christ that we have eternal life. And so it's fitting that the book ends with a phrase that will leave an, a lasting impression on those who would hear the judgment of God and gives us context for the entire judgment. Judgment, 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 and then the book ends with this great promise of blessing, and then it says, says the Lord, your God. So even though they had rebelled against him, even though they had failed him, even though the nation of Israel has not been who God had called them to be, they still belong to God, and he would never fully leave his people or completely reject them, only punish them for a while. How about a key called promise? This is an illustration, a story from Bunyan's, John Bunyan's great allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress. The incident is related in this book about how Christian the main character, decides to leave the main highway and follow another path, which seemed easier. But this path leads him into the territory of Giant Despair, who owns Doubting Castle. So Giant Despair, in his Doubting Castle, eventually captures Christian and keeps him in a dungeon. And in the dungeon, Christian is advised to kill himself because his despair is so great. The giant said that there was no use in him keeping on with his journey. His journey has come to an end in the doubting castle at the hands of great despair in his deep dark dungeon. For the time, it seemed as if despair had really conquered Christian, but then hope, Christian's companion, reminds him of previous victories that he had had, and so it came about on Saturday, about midnight, they began to pray and continued to pray, pray until almost morning. Now, a little before it was day, good Christian broke out in a passionate speech. He says, what a fool am I thus to lie in a stinking dungeon when I may as well be at liberty. 
I have a key in my bosom called promise that will, I'm persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. Then said Hopeful, that's good news, good brother. Pluck it from thy bosom and try. And when he did, the prison gates threw open. This is a story that is an allegory of what happens in our despair. We may get to the end of our robe. We may think there's no other way to turn. But Jesus has provided a way of salvation. And if we just access that way of salvation through the key of faith, then we can be saved by faith alone, in, in Jesus Christ alone, through grace alone. And that is how we're saved. And so really this Old Testament book ends with a very jesus passage of Scripture pointing ahead to the Savior. How do we live? Do we stand on the promises of God? Do we understand that even though the world may not be going like we want it to, that God's still in control? Even though the world may not be uh, functioning according to the set parameters that somehow in our minds we think it should function, do we somehow get in this pit of despair? Do we somehow get hopeless? Uh, My friend, we need hope because Jesus is the answer. Everything we hope in, everything we look for, everything we trust in is based not on the things of this world, but on the promises of God. My friend, we can stand on the promises of God. God always keeps his promises. And these promises are the key to our freedom in this life, to our peace in this life, to our hope for restoration, uh, not only in this life, but in the future, to our security and to our blessing in this life. We must stand on the promises of God. So I hope tonight that this has been a hopeful message for you. And I hope that you can rest in the promises of God because he is great and he is good and he is great and good all the time. It's been good to be with you tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We pray that you'll bless our study. Father, help us to, to not be in a situation of despair, but to, Father, hope in you, because you are the great and awesome God of the universe who has a plan and a purpose that you're bringing about through your people and through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we love you, and we thank you. Bless us tonight. And bless the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, amen.